Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at Chapter 5 test and taking a look at some of the common misconceptions and problems people have had in the past with thermochemistry. One of the things that always surprised me a little bit with this test is the test average is always a little bit lower than I think most students expect it to be. They get confused over some basic things that often they really know how to do if they take their time and think it through. So this is one with a little bit of care. I think we can get a significantly higher test average than our normal do, because typically this is in the higher 70s. And honestly, we should be able to get this in the higher 80s, because as you saw from the review, while there were some people that struggle with different object, or different concepts and ideas, quite a few people did very well overall with the review. So these are some of the things that I want to take a look at with some of the common errors and misconceptions. Calorimetry in a couple of different settings. Um, confusion about just common reactions, whether Angie's going in. Always surprised about that. Heats of formation. There's a couple of basic things that students tend to struggle with with this idea. And also looking at kinetic energy equations, internal energy equations, and energy stoichiometry. All of which have ideas related on the test that students, students will often struggle with. Now, the first two we're going to look at together. Calorimetry and um, heat of solution, molar heat of solution type problems. Now, I'm not really going to do calculations with these because typically people know how to set up calculations. They just make some fundamental mistakes related to concepts in the questions. So calorimetry problem. A typical calorimetry problem is going to be some sort of solution type reaction where some kind of chemical reaction is happening in solution and we're dealing with temperature changes. Now it could be a straightforward Q equals MC delta T. And remember the big thing about this reaction is it's the Q of the solution is going to equal the mass of the solution times the specific heat of the solution, which is a constant, times the temperature change of the solution. And remember, that would be the final temp minus the initial temperature. That'll establish sign. Well, remember, when we're looking at calorimetry type situations, we're measuring what the solution is doing. But what we're really interested in is what the reaction is doing. So remember, we have to take our MC delta T of the solution and multiply it by negative 1 if we really want to get what the reaction is. So remember that negative in front of that Q of the reaction. We need to transfer over here and multiply it times our MC delta T to look at what it is from our reaction point of view. So that's one idea. Remember, while your delta T can establish sign, when you're looking at the solution and we're talking about the reaction, you have to multiply it by negative 1. The solution is part of the surroundings. Now. One thing to, to recognize with these types of problems is when you're really dealing with heat of solution and molar heat of solution type situations, heat of solution would be an energy per gram type question. And a molar heat of solution is typically asking for exactly that, the molar heat. You always need to be aware that in these problems, while at its heart it's an MC delta T, one, as we talked about above, we're dealing with solution. So if they give us the mass of the substance that is in the water, we need to put both together. So both contribute to mass in our calculation. That's one common error. Another thing to recognize is since they're asking for, and this is what I started with in the discussion here with this, since they're asking for the molar heat of solution, remember that basically means get the energy, get the moles, and divide. That's an important critical part of this problem. And remember, when we're getting the moles, it's not the moles of the solution. What we're looking at is the moles of the substance. So we need to convert that to moles of lithium fluoride. Because the molar heat of solution is the amount of energy involved in this reaction occurring. And this reaction is dealing with a specific mass amount. Obviously, if we had a different mass than this, then we'd have a greater amount of energy that would be involved in the reaction. So you need to, if they're asking for the molar heat of reaction or if they're asking for um, the energy per gram in a problem, that means get energy, get grams, divide. And remember, it would be the mass of the system that we're looking at, not the solution. Same would be true for a molar heat of solution. It's the moles of the system, which in this case would be the lithium fluoride. Those are common questions and, and problems people have. So sometimes they know what they're doing, MC delta T and so forth, but they make some issues with signs, they make some issues with masses, and they finish the problem potentially wrong when it's asking for a molar heat. Another thing that I want to mention related to calorimetry type problems is remember, this is an equation that we can use to go anywhere. You can see in 
Uh, this one, it's really dealing with finding the heat, which is calculating Q equals MC delta T, and then going somewhere else with it. In the top reaction, it is at Q equals MC delta T, but in this particular reaction, if you look closely, they're actually giving us this value, and they give us information where we can find this, and we know the specific heat, so if you look at this particular reaction, our unknown is involved with the delta T here. We don't really know what the temperature changes. And when we find that delta T, we use that at the end of the problem. Because this was really T, delta T is T final minus T initial. Well, if we find out what the delta T is in this problem up here, so remember if we're solving for that, we know what delta T is. And they also give us this. So if we add those two together, we would get the final temperature. So there's a number of different places we could go here. I could also ask you to find what the specific heat of the substance was. So solve for C. And then you could potentially use that to determine what the unknown substance was, because the lead specific heat would be different from golds and so forth. Or I could ask you to find the mass or eventually even moles of the substance or solution involved in the reaction. So it's an equation. We can solve multiple things from that one equation. So there's a number of questions on the test related to that that sometimes students struggle with. Um, another thing, this one always surprises me, is when we have common everyday reactions. So I show you a reaction, I ask you really whether it's endo or exo. Now when I give people the delta H and I tell them it's positive or negative, everybody knows positive endo, negative is exo. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if I just give you a situation like Pete's cooling, is that endo or exo? I'm always surprised at how students struggle with this idea. So remember the basic idea is you're asking yourself, does energy go in or out? If you don't have the thermochemical equation, you can't look at where energy is or look at the sign of the energy. You have to think it through. Pizza cooling, it's cooling, it's losing energy. From the pizza's point of view, that's energy out, that's energy lost, that's exothermic. When water condenses, you're going from gaseous H2O to liquid H2O. Well, think about it. Do I have to heat it up to do that, or do I have to remove energy? Well, you've got to remove energy. When it hits a cold surface, it condenses. So when it hits that cold surface, it loses energy. Well, from the H2O's point of view, that's a loss of energy. That's exothermic. So think about it from the system's point of view and track in your head. Is energy going in or out? Now, the last one here, if you're looking at an actual reaction, like this physical reaction listed, it doesn't tell you what's going on with energy. But with some reactions, particularly physical reactions, any change in state, whether it's condensation, evaporation, boiling, melting, sublimation, deposition, when you're going from solid to gas and gas back to solid, you should be able to think about what's happening with energy. Solid to liquid, I have to dump in energy to move to a higher energy liquid state. So I'm putting energy in, that's endothermic. Boiling, I'm putting energy in, that's why it's on the stove. I gotta keep providing it with energy or it stops boiling, endothermic. So think about what energy is doing, and you can often figure out these types of equations. Heats of formation. Gave you some big hints on this one. Do that every year, and still people miss it. There's a couple things. One, you need to understand some fundamental things about what delta F would be and what that would look like in a problem. And then second, writing the reactions. Slightly different point of emphasis, a related idea. So what does it stand for? Well, the triangle means delta change in. So now we're talking about change in enthalpies. That little tiny naught, delta H naught sub F, so we're talking about standard states, which would mean you know room temperature, um, normal atmospheric pressure, one molar if it's an aqueous substance. But one of the most important things is really right out of the definition. You're forming one mole of a compound. That's critical. All standard formation enthalpies are per one mole. And that has a consequence in B. And then remember, they're elements in their standard states. So in, from their elements, in the state that those elements would exist at under standard conditions of room temperature, normal pressure. And don't forget, since we're talking about forming something, we're looking at compounds here, but remember, formation enthalpies of elements, if it's an element in their standard state, it already exists as it is. It doesn't take any energy to make it. So remember, their formation enthalpies would be zero. Now, writing the reaction that these would represent. Well, here's an example of a formation reaction. I'm writing a formation of sulfur trioxide from its elemental substances in their elemental states. This looks like a formation reaction, so is this a standard uh, formation enthalpy? And the answer would be no. This is not expressed as a formation enthalpy because of this right here. While we have met this criteria, we haven't met that criteria. In order for this to be 
a standard formation enthalpy, we have to be forming one mole. So since energy is a extensive property, if we only wanted half of what was listed, we would have half of all the amounts and half of the energy. Now it's written as a formation enthalpy. Those are ideas sometimes students struggle with. It seems so common, but people forget it when they're looking at the test. Another one, this one always drives me nuts. Kinetic energy equation, nice simple equation. Gotta remember, gotta use it. I believe it's on the AP constant sheet. But if I ask a question, so often people miss something fundamental. If I ask for it in joules, joules are SI units. That means masses have to be in kilograms. Remember, this was on the previous test back in one through three. We talked about how often people miss it, and you've seen it in almost every test related to units. Well, if we're dealing with SI units of energy, and if we're dealing with joules, they can say it either way. That locks us into kilograms, it locks us into meters, it locks us into seconds. So while it's a fairly simple equation, don't forget to get appropriate units. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Units, 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 units. In every equation you look at, units are critical. That whole molar heat, find the molar. Okay, that means I gotta find energy, find moles. Use your units, they are critical. Internal energy. By and large, people do fairly well with this, but there's a certain segment that confuses the idea. Now, Q is pretty good. I mean, most people know it's positive when it's gaining heat, endothermic. Negative when it's losing heat, exothermic. They're good with that, but where people struggle is the work, because you didn't do anything with work last year. Remember, positive means work is done on the system. You're putting energy in the system when the surroundings are doing work on the system. That's a positive from the system's point of view. But if the system is doing the work, that's a negative, because then the system is spending the energy on the surroundings, and that would be a negative. So keep that in mind when you're dealing with internal energy. You've got to determine the sign of Q and W. Make sure you choose wisely. And then finally, energy stoichiometry. Um, it's just stoichiometry. Anytime you got stoichiometry, you need a balanced equation, because somewhere we're going from moles of A to moles of B, because that's the whole point of stoichiometry, is we know something about A, and we're trying to get to something about B. You're going from one substance to another, it's got to be stoichiometry, you got to have a balanced equation. Well, when we have a reaction, and they tell us the enthalpy change of that reaction, it basically says it's positive 128.1 kilojoules, what that fundamentally means is when that reaction happens, that much energy has to go in. This is an endothermic situation, and that means not only can we go from moles of A to moles of B, but we can go from moles of A to joules of B. How much energy? Using the same relationship, but instead of mole to mole, it's mole to energy. And in this case, I guess it would be kilojoules of B. Or if they give us the energy, remember we can use this relationship to get from the kilojoules of our, make sure I'm consistent here, of our original substance with the moles of our final substance. And remember, what goes at the beginning and at the end are other two steps. That just depends on what it is we're given. If we're given mass, I can get grams to moles using molar mass. If we're given volume in liters, I can get from liters to moles using molarity. So you've got a variety of different choices on what can go over here. Same thing at the end. You can go to mass, you can go to moles, you can go to a number of different things, including molarity. So all stoichiometry is the same. It's just, what do I need to do at the beginning and the end? And that finishes our short movie on help for the next AP test. Good luck.